Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, a look at some of the top stories expected to dominate the headlines in 2023 for the military and defense communities. Everything from continued fallout from the Ukraine war to recruiting woes and the impact of Republicans taking over the House of Representatives. Our correspondents get into what they'll be watching this year. Plus, a new rifle and machine gun will soon be in the hands of select troops. And the Air Force has plans to roll out several new aircraft this year. And what's the rank just above Very Good Boy? A Marine mascot gets a promotion. We've got those stories and more for you this week with the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. Now that 2023 is officially underway, the stories that will come to command the headlines this year are starting to come into view. With a look at the topics poised to make news in the months ahead, Military Times' team of Pentagon and congressional correspondents talks through what they'll be watching for in the coming year. Check it out. Welcome back to the Military Times Reporters Roundtable, where we bring you the news behind the week's biggest headlines. I'm your host, Military Times Capitol Hill Bureau Chief Leo Shane, and I'm joined in studio today by my dear Pentagon colleagues, Megan Myers, Pentagon uh, Bureau Chief for Military Times, and Joe Gould, Pentagon Bureau Chief for Defense News. Thanks both for coming. Today we're looking at what we expect will be the biggest defense news stories of 2023. We brought a few topics to the table today. Joe, let's start with you, and let's start with the biggest story of uh, 2022, which was Ukraine. The United States sent almost $70 million in equipment to Ukraine to help in their fight against Russia. Does that keep up next year? What happens with this story and what happens with the fight? Well, first of all, I think we're going to see uh, one Patriot air defense uh, battery going to Ukraine, which is being uh, pummeled by Russian uh, missiles and drones. Um, that's going to help them there. One system isn't going to protect um, all of Kyiv, for instance. Um, they cost, um, you know, ten billion dollars, or sorry, ten million dollars of for the launchers, four million for the um, for the missiles. Um, there are some questions that we're probably going to be asking about how uh, the Ukrainians are trained up on them. Um, so that's first off. But um, you know, but on the on the pace of aid, I mean, I think that's that is the question with uh, with Republicans taking over in the House and Republicans increasingly. Uh, expressing skepticism about Ukraine aid. Well, we've already heard in, in the last few weeks, uh, Kevin McCarthy, who's expected to be the House Speaker, saying he's not sure if this aid should continue. There's a, there's a real conservative wing of the House Republican Party that's saying they're going to oppose this. Senate, both Democrats and Republicans seem like they're okay with this. The White House says they're going to keep sending this. So right. is, this, is this just potentially smokescreen? Is this slowing stuff down? Do we have any idea what's going to happen? I, I mean, I think there's a subtle difference. I think what, what Kevin McCarthy has said that, that we don't want to give a blank check to Ukraine. So if I had to guess, um, there, maybe there's a compromise in there where they increase oversight measures for the, for the aid. It is a lot of money um, and it is flowing very quickly. Um, but, you know, what we've seen in uh, other times that, that Republicans have controlled um, the House with a slim majority is that they wind up teaming up with Democrats to get stuff done. And enough Democrats and enough Republicans are in favor of Ukraine aid that we'll see it flow in some form or fashion. Megan, what's the feeling down at the Pentagon right now on this issue? Do they think that it's going to change substantially or is this still, you know, status quo, we'll keep going and Congress will figure its side out? It seems mostly like they're intending to just fulfill any requests or fulfill whatever the White House says. Same thing with the troops that we have mobilized over in Europe. They're all preparing to, to stay where they are into the new year. 
Okay. So let's switch to the uh, biggest personnel topic in the military from last year, which I think is going to continue into next year, too, which is recruiting. This has been a pretty rough recruiting year for the armed services. The Army missed its target. The other services, I believe, made their target. But what is the Pentagon doing now? And in 2023, is this going to be more of the same? So there's a couple of phases of things. The Pentagon is starting to look into, okay, what can we do to kind of change the environment and get a better, better handle on how bad the environment is? But by the numbers, you know, the Army had the biggest, that had the hardest time with the, with the shortfall. Everyone else just kind of struggled to get across the finish line. But most of the services this year have asked to get smaller, including the Army, by tens of thousands. And so that will change their calculation of how many people they need to retain, how many people they need to recruit, and give them a little more leeway in terms of how many people they have to actually bring in. But I know that, that Republicans on Capitol Hill, every time the a Democratic administration tries to pull down those numbers, they end up fighting back and saying, we want more, we need to keep this. For a so could we be looking at a situation where maybe they get just get by in 2023 again, but then all of a sudden have those numbers go back up, have those have that end strength level be increased. That's always a possibility. And I think there's going to be a lot of public and closed testimony from Defense Department leaders and from service leaders about how like you can give us those targets, but we can't promise that that's going to, you know, we're in a tough spot right now. Giving us artificially inflated targets above what we've asked for may not work out in the end. We'll come back to the defense budget in a minute. But before that, the really, really messy things that are going to happen on Capitol Hill, it's going to be some of these tensions with House Republicans and these conversations about the woke military. Mm -hmm. I know you've already been covering this, Megan. I, in, just in, in recent days, we saw the um, House Armed Services Committee have to do some parliamentary maneuvers to stop House Republicans from bringing this to the, the floor um, just to demand every document that has the word transgender, every document that has the word safe space, non-binary, all sorts of things. They've promised they're going to make all of these diversity and inclusion issues a real topic of focus in coming months, saying that it, it hurts readiness. Th that it has the potential to really become a, a friction point between the Pentagon and Capitol Hill. Yeah, I mean, largely it's probably going to end up being a lot of, like you mentioned, them asking for things, maybe calling people to testify. But the Defense Department really doesn't want to engage with that conversation. Senior leaders are, you know, the way that they feel is that this is completely overwrought. It's completely partisan. It's not based on anything that actually goes on in the Defense Department. So sure, we'll hand over all of our, our, our studies and our training modules and all of that stuff. But they're not going to go up there and try to defend something that they don't think is actually happening, but that these lawmakers keep accusing them of doing. They can say that. But you and I both remember when Secretary Austin was up there and got into a shouting match with uh, Representative Gates over these issues. Mm -hmm. They know the idea of critical race theory. Is it being taught at the academies? What does that mean? What does that include? So whether or not the Pentagon likes this and wants to talk about, wants to engage, it seems like we've got lawmakers who are intent on engaging. And I, I don't think we've seen the last shouting match between the secretary and, and lawmakers. Certainly not, but I don't think it's going to be very satisfying what they get out of what the what lawmakers get out of out of these DOD senior leaders because they're going to be practicing so much to just like, you know, not not mm -hmm. react, not get upset. But you know, let me ask you with these, um, cause cause you've seen this for a while, you've covered both the Pentagon and Capitol Hill, you know that plays into the relationship issues. So if they're having those shouting matches and then the next week the Pentagon's gotta come and talk about Ukraine aid or has to talk about what the budget is. What does that do to that relationship? And especially with a split Congress, fine, you can get what you want from a pretty calm Senate side, but will you be able to get any cooperation from the House side? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I mean, I, I think that it, it would, you know, it does potentially degrade the level of trust. I think if the, you know, if, if um, you know, Pentagon leadership feel like they're coming up there to answer serious questions, they're you know, they're open to it, but I think they, um, you know, they don't like going up there to kind of be used as partisan uh, props. And, um, and so that does degrade their relationship. I think they're, you know, they're going to have to uh, continue to interact with senior leaders on the committees. I mean, there's no, no question there. Do you think they there. could refuse to send folks to some of these hearings? It's been a while, but we remember this has happened in the past where the Pentagon has refused to send certain representatives to certain hearings because they felt like it was just a political mess. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think that the that the posture hearings, the you know, where you have Southcom, UCOM, um, you know, uh, combatant commanders defending their budgets, folks from the Missile Defense Agency defending their budgets. I think those are likely to proceed as as normal. But yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. Could the gears grind on some of these other kind of hot button personnel issues, particularly if the you know, if the White House steps in and says, this isn't worth it for you to do this. When we come back, more from our 2023 Look Ahead episode. 
where will troops be headed this year in light of global events and proposed changes to force posture? We'll take a look. Stay with us. Welcome back. In our special Look Ahead episode, we turn to the topic of force posture. Where will the U.S. look to station troops in 2023? And what kind of budget will the military get in the coming year? Our team talks through what we know so far. You mentioned the, uh, the combatant commands and some overseas uh, stuff. You and I had talked before this about some force posture issues and where troops may be located, some changes there. What, what are you hearing about that? Yeah, this is why I brought notes. Um, so there have been a couple of moves in the last few days that haven't um, received a lot of attention. Um, a couple in the Baltics, um, another one in the Pacific. Um, so for Lithuania, the U.S. is uh, ramping up from what it was calling episodic deployments of an armored battalion-sized element and field artillery battery to heel-to-toe rotations. And the idea is to put combat credible forces in the region, obviously post-Ukraine uh, invasion. And then in Estonia, there's a similar move with heel-to-toe rotations of a HIMARS platoon, um, which dovetails with um, Estonia and some other Baltic countries buying HIMARS. Um, and then finally, uh, Lloyd Austin announced plans to increase the presence of uh, rotation, you know, a rotational bomber presence in Australia. So you got stuff happening in Europe, you have stuff happening in the Pacific. All of that, um, you know, all of that maybe falls under what the department said it wants to do in its defense strategy in the Biden administration's um, defense strategy under campaigning, which is like freedom of navigation operations, reconnaissance flights, uh, multinational exercises. So I definitely will keep an eye open. I would, I'd recommend keeping an eye open to see what other kinds of force posture moves we might see um, this year. So we, we kind of got hints of this during the Trump administration when they talked about yanking all of those troops that were stationed in Germany and putting them other places. Obviously, that had some political fighting and some personal things with Trump, but it sounds like the Defense Department's sort of moving towards the, hey, let's, let's take some of that idea, let's spread people out in more places, let's do more work with allies. I mean, these are not places that are completely foreign to, to U.S. troops, but maybe seeing more troops put in those areas and maybe having more interaction with them. I don't know. I, I don't know that I would, would necessarily draw a parallel there between what the Trump administration was doing. I think, you know, that was maybe aimed at sending a message to allies, like they wanted to knock, you know, pulling American troops out of Germany probably is, hey, let's send a message about making a 2% um, defense uh, spending commitment, you know, the NATO uh, Wales pledge. But um, now we're, I mean, the, the whole reality has shifted. We're, this is like post Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I think these are forced posture moves that are like specifically uh, around, um, you know, responding to that. Germany is, you know, European countries have kind of come along and, um, and see now that they have to increase defense spending. So I, I think the, the world has turned, and, uh, and this is a bit different. Megan, what's that mean for just personnel stuff? We've got more rotations over there. It's more people coming in and out. I mean, the DOD has done this for a long time. I can't imagine that ramping that up has too many negative consequences other than getting troops exposed to, to more ideas and more allies. I mean, certainly not right now. There's been 20,000 or so that have been mobilized within Europe or from the U.S. into Europe since the since early last year, even before the invasion. And so this is kind of just moving some of those around or kind of make, making semi-permanent some of those moves that were already there. So that means that once those units have been there long enough, someone will come in and backfill them. The big question it raises for me, honestly, is that the Defense Department has been trying to do sort of this pivot toward Indo-PACOM and looking more at force posture in Asia. And it seems like every time they get to a point where they're like, OK, maybe we'll just change things up there, something happens in Europe and they start having to send more people to Europe. All right, well, look, that, some of that's going to be dependent on the defense budget, too. And that's the final question I wanted to bring up to both of you. We was coming off of uh, another year of of CRs and, and uh, chaos and some uh, upset with uh, some, some problems with the budget here. But ultimately, we saw a pretty big increase in the defense budget, about $850 billion, much more than what the president was asking for. With the Republican Congress, with a what appears to be a pretty sympathetic Democratic uh, Senate, um, how high do you see the defense budget potentially going here? Joe, you, you and I have been on the Hill. Every year we hear the chatter, this is going to be the year that it gets pulled back. This is going to be the year that defense spending gets yeah. pulled under control. 
Are we ever going to see that year in our lifetime? I mean, I think if that year was going to be, it would have come already um, under the Biden administration. But I think, you know, inflation, the situation with um, with Europe right now, I think all of that is conspiring to see ever larger defense budgets. I mean, they've, the you alluded to it, 850 uh, billion. What what the NDAA contained, I think, was about 45 billion more than what the Biden administration asked for. Um, I mean, if you really look at it, the, um, the, with all of these Ukraine supplementals, it's even more for defense spending than, than even that $850 billion. Um, so, Well, and Megan, I know one of the issues that keeps coming up on the personnel side is they're going to be looking at military pay, there's the inflation costs, there's other things. So that's just more and more, even if we're not talking about buying more equipment, just keeping the personnel side you know, Afloat. healthy is... is Costly. Yeah, I think like Joe was saying, I think the worst you'd probably ever see is something that amounted to a flat budget, but there really doesn't seem to be much of an appetite for reigning in the defense budget, nor any sort of plan for like where you would even start if you were going to start cutting things. Because as you've mentioned, the biggest part of the defense budget is the personnel cost. And so that's going to be the first thing people are going to come, are going to come back with if you say that you want to cut it. Okay. Well, look, thanks to both of you. That's all the time we have for in this discussion today. But don't worry, we'll be covering all these stories throughout the coming year over at MilitaryTimes.com and at DefenseNews.com. Be sure to stop by frequently to read up on all the biggest military news. And thanks for watching. Thanks, guys. And now in more 2023 news from around the military. The Army and Marines plan to field a new rifle and light machine gun combination that will replace some of the most widely used weapons in the military. Part of the Next Generation Squad Weapon Program, the new combo will eventually replace the standard M4 carbine and the M249 Squad Automatic Weapon for troops across the forces. Built to handle a new caliber of round, a 6.8mm projectile instead of a 5.56mm, the new weapons are hoped to provide better accuracy at longer distances than the current ones. The first troops to get the new firearms are likely to be Army close combat soldiers, but the specific units have not been identified. More troops will get their hands on the M5 and the M250 in the coming years. And the Air Force also has some new items ready for rollout in 2023. Right on the heels of the B-21 Raider unveiling in December, the force is lined up to take the wrapping off some new fighters as well. The Air Force is poised to purchase 24 F-15EX jets in the coming year and receive its first batch of the new Eagle II jets at Portland Air National Guard Base in Oregon. The Boeing fighters will replace older F-15s with newer tech on a similar airframe. But that's not all. 24 new KC-46 Pegasus tankers are also in line to replace retiring KC-10s and KC-135s this year. And five new MH-136 Grey Wolf patrol helicopters will enter service to replace Hueys on duty at nuclear missile sites. The Air Force is also slated to buy a slew of other new aircraft that will see service in the coming years. Stay tuned. And finally, the Marine Corps has a new policy that started on the first day of 2023. Changes to the way it measures body composition among troops. The force is revising the way it uses the tape test, which measures a Marine's neck, waist, and other body parts against their height for an index. Instead of relying solely on the test, Marines who now score outside of acceptable limits will not be referred for further action until after they are measured by a specialized x-ray scanner. The new technology is said to be more accurate for measuring body composition, and the Corps says the new regs are more conscious of differences between men and women. The changes come following a year-long study on the matter. And that's it for your news roundup. When we come back, our personal finance expert is back with her latest tips on managing your money. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert, Jeanette Mack, 
brings you her latest tips for making smarter money decisions. Lay it on us, Jeanette. New year, new finances. Well, at least that's the hope. Spending less is number four on the list of top 10 resolutions for 2023. And why not? The new year is a great time to set new goals to improve your mental, physical, and financial well-being. Invest in yourself in more ways than one. If you're starting a fitness regimen, start a savings plan too. It'll give you peace of mind and feel great. So go ahead, jump into the stock market and start saving for that retirement. It's easier than you think and it doesn't take loads of money to do it. Your bank or credit union may have a digital investing app that can get you started. And how about dropping some extra weight this year? Try transferring your high interest debt to another credit card with no transfer fees and a lower interest rate. Hopefully you'll have one lower monthly payment and get to being debt free faster. That would certainly take a load off. Then find some balance in your life and in your checking account. Track your expenses and always know where your money is going. That way you can keep more of it. You can make your New Year's resolution a reality. Stick to your guns and your budget and you'll find success. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. To get more coverage of military and defense topics, point your periscope at Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. And to be the brightest trooper in the platoon when it comes to recent events, sign up for our early bird brief for stories delivered to your inbox each weekday. And now it's also in audio. Check out the podcast version. When we come back, the Marine mascot gets a promotion. What's the rank above Very Good Boy? Stay tuned to find out. Welcome back. Marine mascot Chesty the 16th has been faithfully fulfilling his duties since taking over the role in 2022. Part of a long line of Bulldogs representing the service in ceremonies and events, Chesty the 16th has apparently earned more than a handful of treats for his actions. We went down to the promotion ceremony to see a mascot bump up from private. Have a look. I thank you on behalf of all of us, your military family, and I thank you on behalf of all Americans serving our nation since I'm in two. Is it first time for everybody? Yes, very much. It's not every day that the Secretary of the Navy attends the promotion ceremony for a Marine who's ascending from E1 to E2. But Private First Class, Chesty the 16th, isn't just any Marine. After enlisting in February 2022, he is finally a Private First Class. Follow such orders and direction as given from time to time by superiors acting according to the rules and articles governing the discipline of the Armed Forces of the United States of America. Give it out of my hand, Marine Barracks, Washington, D.C., the 13th of December in the year of our Lord, 2022. Signed, Robert H. Sutcher, Colonel, United States Marine Corps, Commanding. Chesty is the mascot. He, uh, he participates in the Friday night parades. Mm -hmm. He successfully has done majority of his parades sitting down, and that's one of his major tasks for the parade. And he's done that flawless, so I feel confident enough that he's able to move on. He has not attacked any scabbers or officers during the parade season. Uh, he's also been to several events where he has not had any issues, whether it's barking or uh, trying to jump on his guests. Thanks for everybody for being here and uh, putting your schedules on pause uh, this afternoon. That's a joke. I need some laughs. I'm a dad. I made a lot of bad dad jokes. Yes, he's a very good boy. He enjoys the attention. He enjoys being around little kids. He's very playful with them. He likes relaxing. He, uh, he enjoys his downtime a lot. He likes walking around the barracks, uh, cheering out the Marines on duty, making sure they, they don't have a bad day. Congratulations on this world earned promotion. You, Marine, are a very good dog, and I thank you. Yes, I actually did handle uh, Chesty the 15 before we retired him. <laughs> so I, I grew attached to him too, but he. Uh, he had a little behavior issues uh, down the road towards the end of his contract. Chesty the 16th is doing a flawless job currently, and I hope to see more better from him coming up. Chesty, do you have any comment you'd like to make? Thank you very much, Corporal and uh, Private First Class, Chesty. And that's all we have time for this week. 
please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.